Hey, what do you say, boys and girls? This is Bobby Blissom Overkill. That's right. And guess what? We just got added to the Milwaukee Metal Fest. We'll be there Friday, May 17th. So stay the whole weekend. Let's get our heads ready to bang. We're heading to the epicenter, Milwaukee. Let's get it on. My name is Bobby Blitz, and I approve this fucking message. Welcome to the show, everybody. What is going on? If you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe, hit the bell if you would. Leave a comment if you enjoyed today's episode. This is number 695 with Becky Baldwin from Merciful Fate. It's a good chat with her. I hope you enjoy it. And I want to thank everyone who got their tickets to Milwaukee Metal Fest, May 16th through the 19th. As some of you might have heard, unfortunately, Destruction had to uh, postpone until 2025. But the good news is Doro is coming from Germany, the Metal Queen. So we got a Metal Queen on the episode today, and we got one coming from Germany from Milwaukee Metal Fest. Uh, May 16th through the 19th. And Milwaukee Metal Fest and today's show is brought to you by Century Media Records. Speaking of Metal Queens, we also have Lacuna Coil for their first Milwaukee Metal Fest appearance. And they will be uh, on tour during that time, during uh, April, May in the U.S. So make sure you get your tickets. It's them. I think Oceans of Slumber and another band. It's going to be a great time. Make sure you come. Get your tickets at therave.com slash metal fest and support all the century media artists that are playing you can go to century media dot store to pick up like the new upon stone which features you know you know i'm always talking about the future headliners of metal fest you got to hear this uh upon stone record it's absolutely crushing they are the future of melodic death metal if you ask me you can check out their debut dead mother moon produced by our buddy taylor young of twitching tongues and god's hate that's another great one to pick up while you're over there at century media dot store also while i have you milwaukee metal fest meet and greets are being added every day over at martyrstore.net plus finally you can pre-order my thrash metal album a love letter to thrash it's called and just for all and yes it's uh it's a fun one 10 originals got chuck billy from testament on there got zetro from exodus got scott ian from anthrax and a bunch of other great guests Go to martyrstore.net after the podcast today, and I will see you May 16th. I'll see you all weekend, but I'll be there May 16th for the pre-party, which will also feature Bobby Blitz from Overkill, Zetro from Exodus, and, you know, the Josta band. Charlie Belmore will be in the house. Shout out to Charlie. Hopefully, Nick will be there, and, and shout out to all our patrons over at patreon.com slash Josta. Go over there, sign up, and wish Nick a, a big congratulations on the on the new addition to his family, little baby Lucy. So congrats to Nick and Lauren and their lovely new daughter who just arrived, baby Lucy. Lucky Lucy, I'm going to call her because that same day, Mind Med went on a run. For those of you who like the rock and like the stock, MNND is the ticker. This is not financial advice though. Okay, Buster, while I have you, one more shout out. Let's shout out Dunnable Guitars. Check out Dunnable Guitars. Dot com And don't forget that they are not only sponsoring today's episode of the Josta Show with Becky Baldwin from Merciful Fate, but they will also be an official sponsor of the Milwaukee Metal Fest. And we're going to have we're going to we're going to be playing some of their guitars up on stage at the pre party. I'm going to have one in the studio and you can check it out right now at DunnableGuitars.com. I will get you a code at some point if you want to if you want to drop some loot on an axe. I suggest that you do, though. And I will be recording my new Josta L, uh, L EP um, with a couple of these guitars because they're they're just incredible. Dunnable Guitars.com. Last but not least, IndieMerchStore.com. Head on over to IndieMerchStore.com after the podcast today and check out the ginormous selection of merch that they have. Everything from death metal to grindcore to uh, to metalcore to death core. I mean, it's just an endless supply. You can never have too many black shirts. That's what I say. You know what I mean? Just when I think I have too many, I go on IndieMerchStore.com and I'm like, oh, fuck. I got to I gotta get this new uh, Carnifex shirt. I got to get this new Ingested shirt. You'll see it. Check it out. And when you're over there, pre-order that new Ingested because it's an absolute banger. It's coming out April 5th. It's called The Tide of Death and Fractured Dreams. And it's coming out on Metal Blade Records. But you can get it now at IndieMerchStore.com and use the code JOSTA10 for 10% 10 
off. That's IndieMerchStore.com, Joss to 10 for 10% off. All right, everybody, episode 695. Like, subscribe, hit the bell, leave a review if you like what you hear. Becky Baldwin from Merciful Fate is my guest. Now on to the show. My friend, the lead singer of Hate Breed, the infamous and notorious Jamie Jasta is in the building. That's what's up. Jamie Jasta from the metal band Hate Breed. That guy's famous. Coffee, death metal, and push-ups. That's Jamie Jasta. Remember Jamie Jasta? You know him. He's podcast, but he's also he's a metal man. I would say you need that. That shit is hard. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. We got Becky Baldwin from Merciful Fate here. First timer. Welcome. Good to have you. Hello. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Where are you right now? I am uh, at home in Birmingham in England. Very nice. So have you been to the uh, to the bench? I have actually only quite recently. I've lived in Birmingham for almost, well, I think, over three years now. And uh, it was only last year that I was like... Hang on, I haven't visited the bench yet. Like, let's just check it out for the first time. But yeah, I think they've uh, they've actually taken it down temporarily to uh, do some repairs on it. So at the moment, it's not up. I don't think. All right, but were you the were you the only one there when you went? No, no. There's always a constant like stream of people coming through. <laughs> right on, right on. Yeah, I'll I'll have to go. Should I get to Birmingham in in, in the next year or so? We'll see. You know, we get a lot of complaints from. The UK fans, when you announce on download or Bloodstock, because a lot of times that'll be the only show for, the band will play for the for the year or whatever. And then it's because it's got to be exclusive, right? Right. Um, but do you do you tell the fans like, hey, make sure you go see us at this show, or do you or do you not engage? Do you say, well? Maybe we'll announce a headline tour after the festival. I never know which way to play it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's hard to, um, because, you know, you don't want to put any blame on um, any exclusivity deals because, you know, they're there for a reason for both you as the band or or as the festival as well. So, yeah, I guess it's frustrating for fans, but also you don't really know what to do as a band member either. (laughs) Yeah. And then I, I, I'm always like, well, maybe the festival will sell out in advance and then we can add a headline date or a headline tour. But I have noticed a lot of bands are announcing UK headline tours, like with with tertiary markets and and deep like places deep in areas where a lot of shows haven't been going. Are, are you seeing that or is Birmingham still a, a like, is there still a show almost every night of the week? um yeah i mean birmingham still got quite a few bands coming through there's always um i think the local band scene um is still very strong here uh but i i've noticed fewer european bands coming here and uh you know generally a lot of bands announcing a european tour and they they leave off the uk completely unless if again you know for an exclusive uh festival appearance and i'm guessing that's because of like the different rules with um now touring Europe in the EU is going to be separate from the UK. Now we're out of the EU, but, but yeah, I, I guess for the bands that have come through, I have seen some like, you know, you'd see it, you'd like read like, okay, London, Manchester, blah, blah, blah. And then there'd be some town that you're like, never even heard of that town ever. Like I didn't even know they had like a venue there. So um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's good for, um, because usually if it's not in one of the major cities, it's probably some kind of independent venue that just has the space to accommodate a band like that. So that's really cool. But um, but yeah, no, it's interesting how it's like kind of changing slightly. Because I have a band uh, that I work with, Crowbar, and they were like, we want to do the full tour, right? We want to do Ton- Turn- Tunbridge Wells and Milton Keys and huddles feel but what what is the most off the beaten path that you spot that you've played that you had a great show at and you were surprised uh god um i can't remember what, what was it called um 
I, 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 it was confusing me because I was sure that there were, oh, it was called Leek. It was a town called Leek, like some little uh, small town, maybe even a village. And I thought it was a typo and it was Leeds. But uh, so I put, oh, we're playing Leeds. And then it's like, oh, no, no, the, it's actually a town <laughs> called Leek. And I'm like, oh, OK. I'd never heard of it in my life. So, um, but yeah, they just had like a kind of um, more of a youth like art center. I think it was that, that we played in, but yeah, never been there since. And, you know, never heard of the town since, but you know, you, you get to explore lots of interesting places as a musician. So I guess that's, um, you know, even as a small band, you can get, get to interesting places like there, maybe quiet, small places, <laughs> not as exciting as, um, you know, the trips I've had with like Merciful Fate, but, um, yeah, it's, it's cool. Well, when when you were on tour with Merciful Fate, and I think it was Creator, we were playing in Gary, Indiana with Anthrax and BLS, and you guys were playing Chicago, and we were trying to figure out a way to get off stage, come to your show, and then get back by bus call. And And I thought, you know, a lot of people would be like, oh my God, you know, this is so great. You're going to Gary, Indiana. Like, we rarely get shows. Meanwhile, people were like, no way. We don't want to go to Air Gary, Indiana. Why aren't you yeah. coming to Chicago? But it was like, we're, we're not coming because obviously we don't want to play the same night as Merciful Fate and um, and Creator. Uh, so how far were those two um, towns from each other? I think about an hour or so. But but there's a lot of traffic out there, especially getting into Chicago mm -hmm. you know, in the evening or whatever. So we didn't end up doing it. We were pissed because we really wanted to see that that tour but let's yeah let's talk about merciful fate and and do you remember where you were when you got the gig or when you got the call can and can you tell us about the audition uh, process if there was one um so uh, the audition process i guess happened completely without my knowledge <laughs> um so um they were they were booked to play Bloodstock Festival, Merciful Fate. And um, it was my first time going to see them. I'd kind of picked up a Bloodstock ticket that week thinking, I, I really don't want to miss um, seeing Merciful Fate this weekend. So I'll go down. And um, little did I know that the night before they played, uh, they were at, they were just staying in Birmingham. And so the night before they played uh, Bloodstock, they were talking about the tour that was coming up. Um, in like October 2022 um, because they needed a bass depth because Joey was on tour with Ahmed Saint um, when, when this uh, when, when that was scheduled for and uh, they were thinking about ideas of, of who to have and they were going through lists and being like ah, I'm not sure if these people are the right the, the right thing for, for what we need um, and you know started to kind of expand their search beyond uh, I guess I guess their initial, uh, thought was suggestions from the management company and um, people that are already already working in the industry, people they kind of already knew from the scene. And they were like, I don't know if this is like Merciful Fate um, really suited. And then uh, they started suggesting some other band names and they were saying, well, it doesn't have to be a man. Um, we've, we've only suggested men so far, but like, does anyone know it, it could be a woman? And, and that was when Hank said uh, that he'd seen um, my videos and he's like oh check out this bass player called Becky Baldwin she does like uh, you know a lot of covers on YouTube and Instagram and stuff and she's the, you know the kind of classic like old school heavy metal that that we do and plays finger style bass as well like you know like Timmy Hansen did so uh, that might be more that might be the right kind of thing and so yeah management and uh, and King Diamond kind of just yeah, got together, like went through a bunch of my videos. I don't really know which ones they were watching. I was really interested to know. Uh, and then they were like, yeah, well, we'll ask her. And um, and they, and then someone said, I don't know how the how they found out that I was going to be at Bloodstock, but they found out that I was going to be at the festival. So they kind of sent a search party out to look for me <laughs> during like during that weekend, um, and then brought me backstage before they went on on stage and um and asked me there and then if I'd like to come and and do the the tour and I was just like this is insane <laughs> I just thought I was here to see the band for the first time I've been a big fan of them since I was like a teenager and um you know love to me Hanson's bass lines so uh, it, it yeah completely um unexpected I didn't put anything forward to um to, to be a part of it or be considered. I didn't even know they were looking for someone. Um, and then, yeah, to be asked to 
um, to join them on a tour was just like mind blowing. And they were like, yeah, would, would you, uh, would you like to do it? And I was like, of course, like, I, I don't know. I haven't, I'm not even going to look at my schedule. I'm just going to say yes. <laughs> wow. So, so are you normally like an impulsive decision maker or did, was this the one where you were like, all right, I don't need to sleep on this. How many times will an opportunity like this one ar arise? I'll just go for it. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, no, I'm not a very impulsive person, I don't think. But um, this was just uh, something on just another level that I just couldn't imagine to be real. And I just thought, like, you know, the, yeah, again, these opportunities don't come up very often. Like, if, if I if there was anything in my schedule um, that stopped me from doing it, I'd regret it for the rest of my life. So it was just like, I'll, I'll find a way to make this happen. Um, and I, but, you know, I, did, I guess for a while, um, at least like a few weeks, I was kind of feeling like, is this real? Like, I don't think, I don't really believe it to be true that it's actually going to happen. Um, it wasn't until basically when I landed in, uh, on the flight in Dallas, so I was like, okay, yeah, no, this is actually going to happen. I'm actually going to play on stage with Merciful Fate. Um, yeah, through all the, like, you know, practicing, learning the songs, through that whole process, I couldn't really picture that it was real um, until, it, until it was. <laughs> and, and, like, how many songs did you already know at that point? Or did you have to start? I mean, I'm sure you had done videos for your socials and stuff of, of you playing some of their stuff, but did you like, how many did you have to learn? And did you want to learn other ones as well? Like ones that weren't in their set, like the ones that you wanted to play. Well, yeah, actually the only one that I really learned like in detail before was into the coven. And that one wasn't in the live set. So I was like, damn it, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just the one that I might have some, you know, basic um, idea of the song. Um, but the whole set list, except for one song, um, m most of it was from the first two albums, which I was very familiar with just listening to, like I know the songs well, um, but I'd, I'd never tried like learning them properly before. So yeah, it was kind of a uh, kind of intense, like learning schedule for those couple of, a uh, couple of months before we went on the tour. Um, just mostly because the, the songs, the structures are so, uh, constantly changing, like they don't have a kind of standard verse, chorus, verse sort of uh, song structures in, in most of the tracks. And one of the songs was uh, Satan's Fall, which is about 13 minutes long. And again, it, it like it repeats like a bit at the start and a bit at the end. Um, but everything else is just like, yep, yeah, key change, like time signature change. Everything's going to be a different feel. So when you're like cramming, uh, I can't remember how many songs, 11 song set, I think it is. Um, and all of the sections of these songs are quite um, removed from each other. They, they kind of, if you listen to them in isolation, you wouldn't think, yeah, that's the same song. Um, it, it gets them all really messy in your head. So uh, yeah, that was something that kind of made me a bit concerned about the set list because it's, it's just a lot to learn in a short amount of time. And um without being able to have a rehearsal or, um, or I don't know. Yeah. Ease yourself into it. It was like, okay, you're going to use in ears for the first time. You're going to be on like a massive, um, stage for the first time in a, like a proper professional <laughs> production. I mean, I've been, I have been touring for years, but on in small bands, um, you know, pubs and clubs, that kind of level. So this was, a big change <laughs> in, in like uh, what I was doing. And and what was the first show and like, what was the capacity of the first show? Was it a big festival or a big headliner? It was, uh, we were played uh, Dallas. What was the venue called? I've I forgotten what the venue's called, but I, I would guess it's about 2000 capacity, maybe 3000. I'm not quite, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but the whole tour was about between, um, 2,000 and 5,000 people in each night. So it, it was pretty big <laughs> to me, definitely. <laughs> yeah. And did you change your live rig to suit Merciful Fate? Was there any sort of um, specs or guidelines they wanted you to adhere to? Um, well, they don't use um, Mac client, like they don't use amps on stage. So that was like a big change for me. Uh, and yeah, there are 
or most of the band are on in ears. Uh, two of them are still using the monitors, but yeah, it's all kind of like uh, digital amps and stuff, which is fine. Like I could still use what I was using. Um, over here with, with my bands, I was using a, the dark glass photon pedal at the time anyway, but I was always running it through an amp. And I, I, you know, I always feel when you play the smaller shows, I feel more reassured to have the amp there. Like you can always hear it. It's always just behind you, like physically there, um, blasting out your bass. And uh, when you then have to rely on just monitors or just innies, it, it made me a little bit nervous, but um, to be fair, like it sounded great and uh, kind of adapted to the in-ears thing um, quite well. Um, it, it felt, I think it felt more natural because I'd spent so much time practicing the songs at home, not rehearsing it in a studio with the band loud and everything. Um, having that kind of controlled volume and my bass was, you know, cutting in, cutting over the top of it, that felt more natural than uh then what i would if i did that with my band that i normally rehearse like in the room with them if you know what i mean so uh so yeah it, they were quite open to whatever my sounds were going to be like and then just kind of like oh well in the, the the first uh rehearsal we had uh it was like the day before the first show they were just like okay so what does it sound like okay yeah that sounds cool yeah we'll use that <laughs> and, and just yeah cracked on with it <laughs> Great. So it wasn't like you had to use a rig that they had used on the albums or they had used live prior and you could. And, and then I guess you're more free to walk around and, and go to the different sides and you're not like away from your cab or your True, monitors yeah. being like, oh, am I, you know, especially stepping into big shoes like that. Right. You know, you you would have been, I, be, I guess, more sort of planted and not had that freedom. True. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that did mean that wherever I went, I could still hear myself really well, still had pretty much the exact same mix. Um, and yeah, so I, I can see why it's, it's definitely a benefit. <laughs> yeah. Now, did you want to play other songs? Like, were there any, I, I was surprised cause I, I even like dead again, like I booked them on that tour in, in 98, they played Connecticut and I, you know, looking through the discography and then looking at the set list. If if that show you're talking about is the um the one at Deep Deep Elm yes. Live, yes, yeah, yeah, October of 2022. Um, I mean, the set is great. I there's not much I would change, but like, what if you could? Like, if you went to King and you're like, hey, listen, you know, I really love this song. Do you? What one would you choose? And do you think you could convince them? Um. I don't know. I guess it might be. I mean, my two favorites were already in the set. So uh, Melissa was already in the set and um, uh, uh, Doomed by the Living Dead. Um, and so I don't know. I guess I, I, want, I was hoping for in, Into the Coven to be there. And yeah, I, I don't know what else. I guess I, I don't know. I was just kind of really just chuffed that it was the first two albums because I, I'd listened to them the most i guess um and I, I don't know another one of my favorites is is that you melissa i maybe because it like it kind of follows on from the melissa one and like that one's really cool but it's not as i don't know if it would work as well live uh, as those like the kind of old school ones would yeah yeah it's tough right because then the fans will also be like, well, we, we just want to hear the hits. We just want to hear the classics, but it, I do like a deep cut occasionally. Yeah. I feel like a deep cut is, is a good one to throw in for the diehards who've, who've seen the band before. Quick interruption, letting you know today's episode is brought to you by indie store.com. And right now you can pre-order the new, well, by the time you're hearing this, it's going to be out. It's the new aborted album vault of horrors. It's out now. And you got to go check it out because it is a banger, son. IndieMerchStore.com. Use the promo code JOSTA10. You'll see there's limited vinyl plus a ton of killer merch, including a Hellraiser puzzle cube. I'm all about that action. I might have to go drop some loot on IndieMerchStore.com right now. So go check out this new aborted album, Vault of Horrors. Make sure you, uh, you use that code. So they know who's driving the fucking sales over there at IndieMerchStore.com. Use the code JOSTA10 for 10% off. And come to Milwaukee Metal Fest May 16th through the 19th and stop by the IndieMerchStore.com 
booth at Milwaukee Metal Fest. They'll have one of the biggest, best booths there because they're one of our official sponsors of the fest. Speaking of the fest, May 16th, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see a little graphic on the screen right now. You'll see the pre-party. We got Bobby Hamble. We got Bobby Blitz. We got Zetro and some more surprise guests that will be announced. The meet and greets are on sale at martyrstore.net, and you can get your tickets to the whole weekend. Keep in mind, you get into the pre-party for free when you buy the weekend pass. Go to therave.com slash metalfest and, uh, and get your tickets before they are gone. Now back to the show. But um, but what is the plan? Do you have uh, do you have tours coming up? Are we going to hear something soon? So the plan is that we have uh, South America, like the, just two shows, um, Chile and Brazil. Uh, Summer Breeze Brazil is the next show, um, and then there isn't that much going on. I think there may be like perhaps the odd show in the next like year or so. But it's going to be mostly focused on a new album. Um, that we yeah, um, have. I've heard the demos and they're sounding fantastic. Um, but yeah, so it's 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 going to take a while because we've got the King Diamond album is going to come next. So King's focusing on that. Uh, then he has to release that. Then do a tour um, following that, and then it'll be the most full fate stuff. So there's definitely a chance for a single um, this year at some point, but not quite sure. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure when, like in terms of like the order of things, but definitely there's two shows this year. And then uh, hopefully we'll be touring a new album in uh, maybe towards the end of 2025 or going into 2026. Now, now knowing that, did you want to put out something on your own with another group or solo or do your own, you know, focus on your content? Like, or are you just kind of, staying in merciful fate zone between now and then well like i've got i mean i've got like i i know i need to kind of uh you know work on the sets before um before south america i need to catch up on these demos because you know they've been kind of working on these for a while and i need to kind of get get used to them get a feel for them but you know this year i i'm not really needed you know they don't need much of my time so i'm working with my other band fury um, that we've been going for i've been with them since like 2017 2018 uh we're gonna try and get our album out this year so yeah so i've still got stuff to work on and as you said like the social media stuff i have a patreon as well myself and um yeah so like i i know that um, the King King Diamond as a band is a big part of King's life. So that doesn't mean that I, so, you know, that means that I can like keep working, doing other things um, on any downtime that Merciful Fate have. Um, but it, you know, it doesn't mean that Merciful Fate is kind of like out of my <laughs> mind or anything. It's kind of just, um, just going to keep chipping away at those new demos until they're ready. That's great. And so these and these shows that you have coming up with Fury, these are in March and April. If people yes. want to go to your website, furyofficial.co.uk. And then you're also doing a festival. Okay, SOS Festival in Manchester. Well, that's nice that they didn't make you sign in a ex exclusivity agreement. <laughs> so you can do yeah. these other pub and club shows, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess, um, you know, the reasons why... Uh, Joey had to go was because he was so busy with Armored Saint. And um, I think that they put the trust in me that I'll, um, I, I can do other, other bands and there's never been any rules of against like doing no other bands because, you know, everyone's got, got other stuff going on in their, in their lives. But when push comes to shove, when like, when there's a, an album like that needs recording or uh, there's a tour that needs um, your commitment, then, then that's there. And uh, I guess that's something that, um, unfortunately, Joey couldn't do because he was such a uh, a big part of Armored Saint. Like it's kind of his band. Whereas with Fury, um, I'm not saying I'm just the bass player, but like they can definitely <laughs> they can definitely operate without me, um, which they did on a couple of shows on when I did the the other tour with Merciful Fate. And um, you know they can continue to do it. And I, as I said, like it's there's not very much going on in the next two years. So um, so I can definitely do a few fury shows here and there before we release an album and then we can book 
um, a lot more dates after that. And and what what is the plan with Fury? Like, will you shoot a video for these albums or or two? Does that even still matter? I see that debate out there. I, I still think it does. I'm hoping that the youth the YouTube algorithm comes back in favor of music videos because I really felt it it help uh, it helped a lot of bands. Now it seems like you have to have a real wild video to get it to hit the algorithm and, or you got to have something really unique, really different looking. But, um, I guess, yeah. What, when will we hear the first single or, and see the video if there is going to be one and do you have to make it extremely crazy to cut through the noise? Oh uh, yeah. I think I know what you mean. You know, there aren't, there's a much less focus on music videos, like music TV. And, uh, I, I still watch music videos. I like the immersive experience of, um, oh, a band's got a, dropped a new single and they have a video for it. Perfect. Like, let's, let's watch it and, and really check it out. But I guess uh, even if you don't have a music video or there's still like a visual element that's needed. So if you don't do a music video, you're going to have to do something else. Like, I don't know. I see so many people now. They just do kind of the the kind of TikTok um, uh, it's like a music video, but it's more casual. It's like um, kind of syncing it with like DIY videos and like lip sync, lip syncing and stuff, uh, that and that kind of thing. Which I, I I can definitely see why it's entertaining and it, it's cool that it's so DIY and you don't need a big budget for it and that's fantastic. But um, unless if you have those ideas, it's um, I, I just don't really know. I don't think it works as well with a band, a band, you know, it works great for um, artists where it's like a singer uh, and it's their project and they focus on, um, you know, doing all of the parts themselves. But yeah, when it's like a band um, situation and all, uh, all members are kind of equal parts of the project, then it makes more sense to do a music video. So uh, yeah, so we'd like definitely, uh, we're definitely going to be doing a music video for an upcoming single, um, which is actually just a, a re-recording of an older one, but we're um, we're doing that as a little like in between <laughs> uh, thing before we get the album stuff done. But I, I mean, I would hope that maybe in the summer, um, or at least the autumn, we'd have the first couple of um, Fury singles from the next album with music videos. Definitely, we we like music videos. We're 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 really into them, and we quite like making them a bit more, you know, not just a performance video in like in a shed or whatever, you know, we like to kind of make it make sense for the, the song concept. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm shooting one tomorrow with a, for a guest spot that I sang on. And I'm like, I just, I'm so busy with all this other stuff. I'm like, just choose the location, tell me where to be and the time. As long as I don't have to wear something wild, like I don't want to wear like some sort of costume or animal <laughs> head or, you know, yeah. I just, I, I, but at the same rate, I'm like, I don't also want to just be the guy in the warehouse doing nothing. Yeah. Like, I, I want it to have a level of production. I like a narrative. If there's a narrative and I got to act, as long as it's not cheesy acting or, or stuff that's not in my wheelhouse. Like, if, yeah. if they need me to do lines before the song, like, no, I'm not. We're not doing <laughs> that. But but I've written video treatments before where I'll have all these different scenes and I'll storyboard it out and then they all get cut or they can't be shot or it can't be shot how I want it. Um, so I see the challenge there, but I also think it's got to be the right song and it's got to be mm -hmm. every it's, it's like, like you have to have lightning in a bottle almost where the location becomes available. The extras are available. You have to have a great team it's it's not as easy as it once was. I feel like now it's you're up against so many challenges and then you do run the risk of, you know, only 10, 20,000 people see it on YouTube and then you put all this time and energy into it. But, um, but, uh, I look forward to see what you come up with and I love a re-record. I'm not anti re-record. I think mm -hmm. that's great for the time being in the, in the, you know, as you prepare the full album, um, plus the band is still fairly small, right? It's not like your existing fans are going to be freaked out about a re-record. Uh, 
Yeah, I think um, it, it's a re-recording of a song um, that was on the very first album, and that didn't have very. It, it didn't have the best kind of recording process, and uh, I think we can definitely make it sound a, bit, a lot better and cleaner now. Um, we've got because uh, we, we now kind of got two front persons, we've got two vocalists, and so we can swap more between them. Um, so, so we like doing that, and uh, so you know, there's definitely changes. Like, I don't think it's ever going to. For some people, it won't replace the original recordings, but it's a kind of a new take on it, and uh, it, you know, it didn't doesn't get in the way of um, of recording the album because we already know the song very well. We kind of just laid it down in the studio really quickly and used it as a um, a way to test out new studios because we were looking at changing um, changing how we record. So we were like, well, let's do something we know really well, um, not part of the album. So, it, and if it comes out well, then we know we have a new place to record the next album so that was it there was a few things that kind of it ticked a few boxes and so we just and actually like a, a couple of songs we've re-recorded from that album because they just need they deserved like they deserve something better like a bit more life if you know what i mean right on what if, do you know what the song is about like can i pitch you uh the narrative for the video of what it might be <laughs> like do you know the <laughs> lyrical content Oh, okay. Well, so um, I hope we haven't really announced this yet, but I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure it's being announced very soon. Uh, the song is called "The Prince of Darkness," and it um, it was originally about um, uh, a friend who plays darts, and his kind of darts name. Um, he was known as the Prince of Darkness. So when he uh, would go up and, and do his shots at darts that he he was called the prince of darkness and so that was like his intro music or something if you imagine it but um but so yeah it's it's kind of about the devil <laughs> in a in a way <laughs> all right so so if you if you had an unlimited budget what would you do would you want some gore in there would you want some fire some flames some actors some extras or do yeah. you go, or do you go the funny route? Do you try to get like an Aussie impersonator and and, <laughs> and follow him around? <laughs> that would be really cool, actually. Like, yeah, at the moment, uh, the ideas are uh, fire and like um, kind of satanic ritual themes. That are, that's probably going to be the route we're going to go down because it's possible within our budget. So you have to see how it actually uh, pans out. We managed to pull it off because that's the thing, as you said, about getting the extras and um and yet yeah, the availability from from people um who are up for painting themselves red and although i don't know we've we've had quite, we've been quite lucky we've had a lot of people willing to like paint themselves red and be, be a devil for all, for us <laughs> in actually two videos now <laughs> this you, will be the third we have a theme appearing <laughs> do you have a local farmer you could borrow a black goat from and get a little black philip in there or something like that can you Wow, yeah, that's a good idea, but I I don't know. I don't have any like goat goat herd friends. <laughs> <laughs> kids kids and animals are the hardest ones, right? Like yeah. that, I I had that idea at one point and I remember pitching it. I what god, what year was it? It was it was early on. Actually, it might have even been for another another band and and I remember just calling around cuz I'm not, you know, I'm right north of New York. I guess in New York city, you probably have more options, but um, I'm like 80 miles North. And I remember people were like, no, I'm not renting you animals. And then I pitched the, the idea of like burning a, um, a, a pentagram in the ground and like shooting it. But this was pre, this is before drones. Like this is in the nineties, late nineties. And I was like, well, if we do it close to the house, we could shoot it from the roof. Like we don't have to rent a crane. <laughs> so I'm sure I'm sure by now with tons of people have already burned a pentagram in the ground and, and shot it with a drone for their video. Um, yeah. But but as far as having kids in the video, I think the best one was Pantera. It's either Revolution is my name or I think it's I think it's the one maybe Michael can look it up. I think it's the one off of uh, reinventing the steel where the little kids are dressed up like Vince and Dime and and, <laughs> and, and Phil and Rex. But that. It has, as far as I know, it hasn't been done in a while. So, I mean, if you did have little kids in the video as you guys, that could be hilarious, especially if they're doing a satanic uh, ritual. But then, you know, the parents won't sign off on the... <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> on the acting release or whatever, right? Like they'll be like, wait, what, what are they doing? Oh, they're going to dance what? around this flaming pentagram just for the day. Here's 20. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I feel like it's difficult enough, <laughs> right? Get, you know, getting the shots that you want um, <laughs> when you have the vision and you're kind of in charge of it. And um, yeah, but I, I, I don't know. I think it would te- definitely be a lot. I don't know. A lot of uh, health and safety issues as well. <laughs> this, this new new spot that I'm in right beneath me, the basement, there's this old foundation and then there was a new foundation and in the old foundation, which no one knows when it was built, but they think it was built by this super high level Mason back in, I don't know, the late 1800s. But it does kind of look a little dungeony. And I thought, oh, I should rent this out to bands <laughs> yeah, to, <laughs> to shoot videos in. And I made the mistake of saying that on the phone while my girlfriend was there. She's like, no, no, I don't want any bands driving in and out, like, you know, like shooting dungeon scenes i was like oh shit i'm I'm caught i can't (laughs) i can't do it but um but back so so back to merciful fate i got totally off track i'm sorry because i i love the 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 music video talk i i still feel like one day i will i will make the quintessential hate breed music video we haven't done it yet because of budget constraints because of scheduling Mm -hmm. constraints but um back to merciful fate mark horror armenta in the chat here he says Egypt was a hit. Not sure why they don't play it anymore. I agree. Now that's one you could campaign for. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, yeah. I think, um, I guess, like, with the return of uh, Merciful Fate, like, having not toured in America for 25 years, they were like, well, I I don't know, what do people want? Um, Let's give a chance to uh, all the young people coming through who have never had a chance to see any of these old songs so let's bring those back first um and then i guess maybe once um once we've kind of done a bunch of these countries again uh we could be adding some of the later later stuff like egypt that would be really cool then you could have a sarcophagus come out on stage some a pyramid <laughs> backdrop some like yeah will there be the thing, there's more <laughs> concepts and like you know stage design and maybe like all this stuff works within uh King, king's vision of um of you know the, the visuals with the music that were that's being played of those two albums but maybe uh later stuff he's going to be like oh no 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 because then we'll need <laughs> we'll need this and this and this and then the production team will go oh my god <laughs> right right does um does he still smoke on the bus no Okay. That was, I always, I always heard that, you know, like in the back lounge with the, with the air can or no, with the heat on in the back lounge, does he allow the air conditioning on the bus or does that mess with his voice? Um, generally we didn't really have it on very much. Um, and that's good for me because I hate being cold. (laughs) Um, and it wasn't like, it wasn't insanely hot, um, when we were in America. So I, I guess, uh, maybe that's why, but yeah, they kept it always pretty warm in there. All right. Did he get, did he try to get you into NASCAR? Was it during the NASCAR season? Oh no, we didn't really, uh, no, I mean, he didn't really speak about it. <laughs> really? Okay. Cause I heard he, I heard he likes NASCAR too. What was the other one? There was another, I forget. There was another thing I had heard throughout the years, like different, you know, you hear different King stories. You never know which, which is real, which is fake, but on the Hapri bus, we keep it Arctic. Like people hate it. They, you could see your breath on there. It's like the Exorcist, uh, <laughs> the movie. It's like the Does movie. Does that not te- affect everyone's voices, or um, do you our, not mind? Our, our, I don't mind it, but our drummer hates it. He's right. yeah, he's like, well, and also our guitar player Frank. He lives in Florida, so he just loves it warm mm-hmm. all the time. But we live in you know New England, so like we're we're just used to the cold and we like it cold. Like even now I have the AC it's, it's January dead of winter. I have the AC in my on in my bedroom. Wow. <laughs> <It's mad. laughs> um, what was the other one? There was another one besides the smoking in the back lounge. Well, that's great that he doesn't smoke in the back lounge, but I heard it was just heat NASCAR and the TV chain mm-hmm. smoking. Um, <laughs> what about, uh, what was the shit? I lost it. And it was a good one too. It was something on there. Oh, I remember. Cause we did Milwaukee metal fest with them in 98. I think it was. What about the road case 
for the wine? Does the wine still get its own road case? Uh, I don't know, actually. I didn't see, see a separate case for wine. <laughs> that could have been one of the other guys at the time. Okay. Yeah, maybe. What, what kind of wine was it? It was expensive and we were told to, to stay away from it. And I think we might have even we might have even gotten in trouble for I'll have to ask Jack Koshik, the old promoter. But I think we got in trouble for taking a bottle out of it oh. uh, because we were <laughs> we were kids and we were, you know, snooping around backstage. And we were like, we don't even have we didn't even have a trailer for our gear. We were sleeping on top of the gear in a van. So we thought that that was amazing that a band had enough money to travel with their own climate controlled road case for the wine like your own traveling wine cellar we're like that's when you know you've made it merciful fate they they if anybody deserves to have their own traveling wine cellar it's king and the boys so <laughs> i don't think they they have as much priority on alcohol and cigarettes as they used to <laughs> <laughs> hey everybody jumping in for a quick interruption letting you know today's episode is brought to you by centurymedia.store that is the place to go to support all of the killer century media bands that are going to be playing this year's Milwaukee Metal Fest i want to thank century media for not only bringing us today's episode with Becky Baldwin but also being one of the official sponsors, one of the official supporters of Milwaukee Metal Fest. This is our second year back, and we're just thrilled to have their acts on the show. Make sure you see Skeletal Remains on tour now, supporting their new album, Fragments of the Ageless, which I got to say, I played that on the music show on the Patreon, and people were loving them. I've taken them out on tour before, and the band just absolutely shreds if you're into that brutal death metal they are one of the best and brightest of this next generation. Also, Night Demon is going to be playing their first Milwaukee Metal Fest appearance. And we're so psyched to have a power metal um, and, and classic heavy metal sound on the Friday night. And a lot of people are really looking forward to seeing Night Demon. They're one of those must-see bands on the Friday, May 17th date. But we got Bewitcher, we got Stabbing, we got Lacuna Coil, Upon Stone, and a bunch of other great bands. Make sure you go check out their releases today after the podcast at centurymedia.store now back to the show yeah what what's it like is any metal getting played on the bus like what do they listen to it was actually kind of um it was quiet for the first couple of weeks and then i was kind of like i really want to put some music on like can i hook up my bluetooth and then they're like oh i don't know how it works and i was like okay i can work this come on like I'm, I'm a millennial, I can figure this out. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, like, but then I was just kind of in charge of it. And, um, and, and they were just kind of like, why do you listen to all this stuff? Like you're like, this is the stuff that we listen to. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's cause I, that, that's why I'm here. Cause I like your band and you play <laughs> stuff like this. So this is the stuff that I, I listen to anyway. So yeah. Okay. Most of the, the, <laughs> the music was kind of like, Judas Priest and um and UFO and stuff like this. But um, but yeah, that, that's kind of why I'm here. <laughs> right on. Uh, well, but yeah, so it was cool. Like, and and um what you know, what was really nice was uh, just starting to hear the stories like like that you tell as well, um uh, of these bands, like times that they've met the bands that they've always looked up to and um and all this stuff was just really cool. And, you know, bands that they'd been in previously, like Mike Weed, um, he'd been in, uh, so he'd worked with uh, uh, Messiah from Candlemas on uh, what they called uh, Memento Mori. And I, I'd, I'd never really listened to them very much, but um, but he was like, oh yeah, check them out. I think you'd like them. And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> A few months later, I'm like, I love your band. <laughs> That's awesome. I would I'd be asking King about the Brats, right? That he had a punk metal band or mm, yeah. before before Fate. I'd love to hear that if there's any recordings out there. And Hank, uh, I I mean Hank, I, I have his other records too. He he did a couple records, but yeah, you should ask Hank if you get the chance. Say, hey, what's this about a road case? You guys used to have your own wine road case that you would trying. <laughs> no, I don't know. Maybe don't ask. <laughs> you like, what are you what are you talking about? But I could have swore they, they there was one at, at one point. Um, what was the other one? There was there was one other one, but yeah. I will definitely ask. At some point, it will. I'll remember, and it'll come up, and I'll be like, 
Yeah. So <laughs> did you have a separate <laughs> road case for just wine? Yeah. And asking and who about was, who brass, was it that was yeah. into the wine? Like I, I, I don't really, um, uh, you know, Biane, the drummer, um, he drinks, he tends to be on the wine most of the time, but um, everyone else is, it, it's only really him, to be honest, the big wine drinker. Now, when you did the tour, what was the most surprising guest or what was the coolest guest that came to the show that you met backstage? I'm sure there was a bunch of them, but. It was definitely uh, in LA, Dave Grohl came and I was just not expecting to see like probably the most famous man in rock music (laughs) to be at a Merciful Fate show. Like I I didn't really know he was a big fan. Um, I, just I, I don't know I just not someone that I ever expected to meet and then uh, I heard that we were kind of we were kind of uh, backstage and about to go into the green room and they're like oh you can't go into the green room and I'm like why not it's our green room and he's like oh well Dave Grohl's in there and I'm like what who <laughs> like you, you, what <laughs> um but like uh, that's also my green room so I want to go <laughs> um but you know it, 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 it but you know it's all cool um and I was just kind of like just really excited because I mean I've I've never been a huge Foo Fighters fan to be honest and I personally didn't really believe all the hype not I feel I sound really bad now like (laughs) you know everyone talks about him being like the nicest man in in music and I'm like nobody could nobody's that nice like seriously I I don't believe it it's just a, a facade and nobody gets that big in any industry without stepping on a few people and pretending that they're all like you know everything's fine um but then i did meet him and i was like oh no he is really nice he's really sweet so um i guess i was completely wrong <laughs> yeah he totally is any he, any he, a lot of times he's like rolling solo or rolling like with very few entourage i met him backstage yeah. at download just like wait no security nothing just kind of like just making his way to the bus alone and you're like wait what is going on here i mean that was 2005 but still it was you know i had heard that even leading up to that point, like, oh, he's just the best dude, doesn't take himself too seriously. Yeah. Yeah. I um, came across this video uh, from that show of him just like rocking out, watching Myrtle Fate and like screaming along. And he just looked like, you know, any other person in the audience that night, uh, just watching a band and and letting loose. And that was so cool. And uh, I think I was kind of aware of where he was in the audience. So like um, w- watching when, um, when the two support bands were on. Um, and so I was kind of walking past just being like, Oh, I know that Dave Grohl's just in there and nobody here knows, but he's just kind of managed to like blend in enough to kind of get into this little area. And, uh, and nobody's really spotted him, which is really, really cool. That's great. I, I liked what you said about the, the side band, Right. And, and I, I made a note here to tell just cause I want to go listen to that. You said it's members of candle mass and who else ah so yeah it was um yeah the singer of candlemas uh mike weed who's in uh, king diamond and merciful fate uh also snowy shaw was on drums and he's no in way diamond. yeah yeah have you met uh, him uh not, not in person yet but um I, i've spoken to him um online and and yeah he's really cool so it's all very exciting yeah <laughs> like yeah, opening up it's just opening my mind to all these like great bands now (laughs) there there are so many bands in that merciful fate universe in that Mm -hmm. orbit and so many great side bands like i remember when charlie right charlie played bass in in merciful fate right for a little bit and then i remember hearing his other bands and i just the other day was listening to that night flight orchestra have you heard that oh yeah so good right because he he was in that too yeah so so there's like there's just so many talented people in that merciful fate orbit or that at one time you know jammed with them or someone who jammed with them so yeah we should do a we should talk about all those different projects because then you know people will go listen to them and 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 discover them like we have i mean witchery i think charlie was in too who were great um maybe spiritual beggars. I keep, there's so many bands to keep up with. It's like every day I'm remembering another favorite band or another favorite project. But yeah, what, I guess what would be another one you would, 
would recommend. I should look up Snowy Shaw's projects. Yeah, yeah, he's still doing stuff. And um, uh, another one from Mike Weed uh, was Abstract Algebra, which uh, they only did like one album, I think, and it like it it just totally didn't hit the industry at the right time. Um, you know, people weren't wanting that kind of metal uh, in in the kind of nineties, and. Um, but yeah, they kind of re-released it like um, recently, uh, the album that he did with them. And uh, that was, it was just a really interesting project. And it's exactly the right kind of style of metal that I really love. Um, but yeah, when I, um, you know, was about to go on the Merciful Fate tour, I felt like there was so much, there was so much background, so much history, so many like names to learn. And then I, I just had to like, just keep going on Wikipedia, and, like doing a deep dive and be like, Oh, so this is this person. And they were in that band, this band, this band. And I'm trying to like, remember it all. So I don't sound like really stupid when I go on tour with them. And I don't know anything about their lives, which I, I should do. Like, because I was, you know, I was a fan, but I wasn't like, um, you know, I didn't own every album. I didn't know the whole law in, until you know more more recently and so now you know fans of my you know the band that i'm in merciful fate tell me things about the band that i just have no idea about and i'm like that's really interesting <laughs> um yeah thanks for updating me on that because uh, <laughs> there's so much there's still so much to to learn and um and yeah like to check out in terms of like bands associated with the with these uh, musicians yeah, we could do a whole deep dive music show on just the various projects, right? Because you got Dream Evil and Therian and I mean, yeah, Snowy alone, but but also with Hank and um, yeah, Mike. Mickey, like Mickey D um, Mickey was in King Diamond for, for a while and like, you know, Scorpions Motorhead, like it, it was because, uh, yeah, I, I guess also King Diamond, I didn't know all of their eras and and I was just watching a video and I'm like, oh, that's Mickey D. And I, yeah. okay, I didn't, I didn't really know that until, um, uh, later on. So, uh, yeah, it's really cool history. I mean, Mike, when we were kids, we had his other band, we had a CD of his other band. I think it was edge of sanity. They were like way before their time. I, he'd be great. I have to get him and snowy on the podcast. We keep, that's a whole other that's a whole show unto itself. But yeah, I need to check out Abstract Algebra. I remember hearing about that, but he also jammed in the Haunted too, right? At one point, um, or or worked with them. Yeah, those Swedes, man. The Swedes, <laughs> they are metal maestros. I mean, they really are. They Yeah. It's it's impressive. Even even the the most obscure Swedish side projects are commercially competitive yeah so much of the stuff that's out there yeah and i think it seems like they all kind of know each other and i guess sweden isn't a very big uh or particularly like densely populated places except for like you know a couple of cities i suppose especially for musicians so they're all kind of in uh, similar places but every time i meet uh, a swedish um musician they're all like oh yeah i know mike <laughs> so they all just like know mike and mike's like oh yeah he's swedish and he plays metal so i know him <laughs> well, okay that's cool and you know probably even um like norwegian and the danish as well like they they it i, I don't know maybe, maybe i'm assuming too much that they're, they're closer together than i think it's like probably people assuming that i knew the queen or something but they do seem to know each other <laughs> It, and and some of it's so good where I wonder, like, did they make some sort of Faustian pact? Like, did, <laughs> did, is there a deal we don't know about? And I and I know King has, you know, talked about that philosophy or or talked about at least Levian Satanism. But do you are you ever down for that? Or are you scared of that? Do you ever think, uh oh, like, did um, I make some sort of deal now to get this opportunity? Do I am I in the pact? <laughs> um, it doesn't it doesn't really worry me um i think i i you know i was like kind of interested in it when um you know when you just don't know the people at all like i, I didn't know the band at all when i was about to just go on a like a five week long trip with them i was a bit like okay maybe i should find out more about what they're about um you know other than the music side of things so but like i watched those of interviews um i've been talking about it and it's you know it's completely aligned with kind of what I like believe about religion and 
um, and kind of morality and ethics and stuff. Like a lot of it is, yeah, like <laughs> very seems very reasonable to me. So, um, so yeah, none of that really uh, frightened me. I think um, that I guess there've been times when, um, as you say, you just think like, how is this crazy stuff happening? Um, how is this all possible? And I think, like, is there some kind of weird satanic conspiracy that's, like, making all these great things happen? <laughs> um, because, of course, like, the government, you know, they must be in on this satanic stuff because, you know, it's all it's all part of it. And I don't know, you just kind of, when you're sleep deprived, um, like I was perhaps at the start of the tour, you have, like, crazy ideas. And uh, I was just thinking, like, oh, God, is this all, like, kind of eyes wide shut kind of stuff? Um, but it's... I, I, it, like, <laughs> no, but at the moment, no, like, like none of it scares me. Uh, none of that kind of stuff worries me at all. Right. So you're not like getting to the LA day and they're like, Oh, Dave Grohl's here, but also we're going to like meet with the head of the church of whatever <laughs> <laughs> secrets or the head of some secret society or, or something like that. No, I, I think he's talked um, about it where, you know, he talks about the devil, but not in the sense of it being um, like in reference to it in the Abrahamic religions, right? Like more of a life philosophy of freedom and you don't need to believe in a, in a, a God or a devil to just be a, a decent person and sort of follow your life's path. And I'm paraphrasing. I could be totally off. Yeah. But. No. Yeah. I think you've, you've got the kind of general idea there and like, um, I, I do think it's kind of ironic that it be then became, you know, the kind of rejection of organized religion turned into almost like an organized religion, like a, the satanic church and um, the church of Satanism. So, um, but I, I don't know, like, I, I, I think that is a bit of a, a contradiction, um, but, but still like what's behind it, like what they're, they aim to do in, um, uh, it is like not really concerning. And I think, you know, the press did like to uh, whip up uh, some kind of controversy, controversy about, about um, Satanists and, and stuff like this. And therefore like bands and uh, musicians who play that kind of thing, or, you know, subscribe to those kind of thoughts. But um, yeah, it's, it's all very, I, I, I don't know, like, if you speak to, if you listen to anything like the King says, he's uh, talked a lot about how religion has like a terrible history of, um, of just atrocities, like in many places of the world, all different kinds of religions. And if we could hold them to more scrutiny, uh, you know, more so than the, as much that we do to like the satanic church or whatever, then, you know, you may find more information uh, that, puts you off kind of organized religion yeah it's like an easy it's an easy target to say like oh king diamond's coming let's go protest it or whatever but not look into actual real stuff going on in the world that is being committed in the name of other things yeah um did you ever did you ever talk to mr sherman about his other band fate and do you know about that one um I is was that the one like just after Merciful Fate broke up in the kind of like late eighties? Yeah, he's like yours is Merciful Fate, our like ours is Fate. Now we're just Fate. Like I, that's what I thought originally, but it's yeah, it's much different. But like, the, it. wasn't it more um, like rock, uh, rock commercial, rock. like rock kind of? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I've not like listened to very much of it to be honest, but I think I, I do need to check it out because he, he's a great guitarist. So. Um, but you know he also loves a big chorus, so uh, you know. <laughs> but like both of those things are I love as well, so I might have to check that out a bit more. Right on. Um, so what's the pre-show like? Is there a huddle? Like, is there a mantra? Is there do you do you all put in and you're like, all right, Satan on three or whatever, Melissa on three? <laughs> like, what it, like what it? Or do you just walk out alone and you just get up there and you're like, roll the intro? Um, I think uh, it, it kind of separates out a bit because, like, we, you know, we'll, we'll be entering the stage. Oh, why is my camera turned off? I don't know what that I is. still I can still oh, barely yeah. hear my voice. So hopefully Michael isn't having like an okay. audio <laughs> editing nightmare. Oh, there you are. Yep. Right. Um, 
uh, because you know we separate off to like different sides of the stage. There isn't that much of a ritual altogether, but there will be um, uh, stage right kind of a bit of a, a little thing because we always stay, stand behind um, the stairs that they have on on the at the back of the stage, and uh, we'll have a little like fist bump. Um, before we go on and then uh, we have to listen for the intro and then when like the laughter starts at the start in the intro track of the oath that's when me and Mike have to run around the side of the stage to, to get on in time um, so yeah like, I, I don't think so I think everyone's like in their own kind of space and I like that because you know the first couple of shows I was like, don't talk to me. Like, I'm so nervous. <laughs> please leave me alone um, in, until uh, until after the show, please. So, yeah, you, it's just kind of getting getting set up and um, getting your head in the game, really. And what's the what's the backstage rider like? I I had to go by. My friend Eric picked up King from the hotel. He was like my runner for the day when I booked the show, and then I did all the shopping for the backstage. I have the writer here somewhere. Like I always saved all the band's writers and occasionally I'll thumb through them and, and get a, a kick out of certain ones requests. But is it, is it anything new, different, any tea, any, any weird uh, requests? Um, I don't think there's really anything um, unusual on there. Like there was by the end of the American tour, there was so much chocolate. Like <laughs> just um like it was i think it was lint or um like 70 percent dark um chocolate and and i like that that's good because uh, i'm vegan and so and that doesn't contain any milk so i was like really keen for that um but i think we're getting like five bars of it a day and um we would not usually not touch them but we take <laughs> them onto the tour bus and just put we had this drawer we'd open by the end of it and uh yeah uh, yeah, it was completely full by the end, and I, I don't and do know. you fly home with it or no? Take a couple for your bag. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I did take a few out um, at the end, uh, but yeah, I couldn't really take that much. <laughs> I'll, if if we're flying home from like the West Coast, I'll take like maybe like a pound of coffee or something off the bus. I usually feel bad that a bunch of it's getting wasted, but I mean, I guess in a sense, you're lucky that it's not like like an Axl Rose situation where you have to have like a, a baby lamb roasted at 10 PM right before. And then you have all this like lamb on the bus or something that, that you don't need or don't want, especially being vegan. You probably wouldn't be stoked on Axl having a, 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 you know, a lamb on a spit backstage, but. Yeah. To be honest, like the, there wasn't much food that traveled with us, to be honest. I think I was probably the only person who was hoarding food. because like, You never know in some places in America, you never know where you're going to find the next opportunity to eat something um, that's like vegan and, and decent. So, um, yeah, <laughs> so I was like, OK, yeah, I'm going to be traveling around with this like um, this avocado until <laughs> for emergency uh, situations. My, my daughter's vegan and I, I break her chops a lot about some of the stuff because i mean some of it just seems so super processed and and unhealthy it mm -hmm. almost seems like an antithesis to what the vegan diet should be but she got these slices the other day and i'm always i always sort of kind of roll my eyes at it it's like bologna style or whatever you know it's it's a it's a veggie version of i guess something that would be considerable to pepperoni but it was actually really good i had mm -hmm. it on a sandwich with lettuce and pickles like you would a deli sandwich but it was made from chickpeas and it wasn't soy it wasn't super processed it was made from like chickpeas and herbs and spices but it was like sliced like a deli meat and i gotta say was, i should probably give the company a shout out on the podcast but <laughs> uh but becky thank you so much for the time and uh we look forward to seeing this fury video if anybody wants to be an extra in the video just hit up becky now <laughs> if anybody wants to direct it do you have a director like can they pitch you if someone's in the uk and they want to direct it or they want to um yeah i guess so i guess so like yeah we just have uh the some camera people which I guess we'll probably direct it like for the time being. But if there's someone else who wants to like help out in any way, then yeah, we're all ears. <laughs> yeah. And go see you at the, at these gigs coming up in March, fury .fury .uk, And, um, and, and go see crowbar 
in March too. If you, if you get a chance, go check them out. Say hello to Kirk. They will yeah. be out with a thrash band called Inhuman Nature who kick ass too. Oh, cool. So um, where where are the shows again? Did you say Tunbridge Wells and... Um, yeah, they're uh, playing Newcastle. They're playing Huddlesfield, Manchester. Wait, are they playing Birmingham? Yeah, they're playing the Asylum on uh, March 3rd. Okay, cool. So cool. We'll, we'll put you on the list. Go say hi to Rob and his, his lovely wife. Excellent. Thank and, you. Yeah, I'll uh, put that in my calendar now, 3rd of March. And hopefully we'll see you with Faye sooner than later and i can't wait to hear the album and i'm very jealous that you got to hear the demos <laughs> yeah well i have to hit the demos at some point <laughs> <laughs> you're you don't know how lucky you are you this is well i'm sure you do but <laughs> yeah no i know <laughs> but also is there really luck you were prepared you did the work you put in the time and they had seen you i mean that's amazing yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's the thing when you start putting things, um, putting your music out there on the internet, uh, well, you're playing, then you don't know who's going to see it. And like, that's quite exciting because, you know, it could be not very many people or it could be loads. And you never know who's going to like notice it and think, actually, I have a plan for this person and I'd like to work with them. Um, so that's, I, I'm really glad I started posting um, bass videos because I, I don't think I'd have. I definitely wouldn't have the career that I do now if I wasn't doing that. And I don't know, some people say that, oh, well, you know, why have you got this like B-list uh, musician in? You just like got, grab someone from YouTube rather than a real musician, but a real musician. Um, but I, I, I don't know, like what else are you meant to do in your downtime between shows? And like, I, I, you know, I still do tour. I've always, um, you know, played live as my main aim, but um, in terms of like uh, adapting more to the online realm, which where most people consume music now, you've got to be online and you've got to put yourself out there online. You can't just only play shows and uh, hope for the best. So, um, yeah, so that that's just. Yeah, it's, it like, it's, it's and it's a great way of networking, even when you don't you might not even know you are networking. And it's so mm -hmm. it's it's one part hustle and one part talent where you yeah. know i've i've had that debate many times like does hustle beat talent and vice versa so it's like you got the best of both worlds there by getting your name out there and, and getting your playing out there um it's yeah. an inspiring story and, and people should uh take from it you know what they need to take from it and learn because you never know what's going to give you a leg up in this biz having no, yeah. having done it for you know 30 plus years i i love stories like this because Yours is uh is one that a lot of people can say, yeah, I gotta get, I gotta, I gotta get myself out there. I gotta, I gotta make more videos. I gotta make content. I gotta be, but also you have to be cool and you gotta be the right. You gotta be able to mesh with people and you gotta when the moment does call, you gotta be prepared. So it's yeah, better to. Yeah. I always say, stay ready so you don't gotta get ready. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think you're right. It's. Um, it's talent and um i think it, it's a lot of luck of course like I, i've definitely been lucky with how this all happened but um the hustling makes you more lucky if you know what i mean if you're not if you don't keep trying you're not going to get as lucky as uh you would be if, if you were just kind of waiting for the opportunity to come to you so um yeah the opportunity did come to me without me really seeking it out but like there was I gave it lots of opportunity to happen, I suppose. So it's kind of a mix of all these different things coming, coming together to make me very happy. <laughs> right on. Well, thanks so much, Becky. Have a great rest of your day. And yeah, if you see snowy or, uh, or Mike or any, or Hank and, or the King say, hopefully you had a good time on the podcast and I'd love to have him on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. Awesome. Take care. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody from Patreon. Thanks Mike. Just a quick little outro and after the outro or after the show. Thank you for all your support. If you liked what you heard and you want to donate, you can, it's a uh, dollar sign Jamie Joss on cash app. Any donation gets you a shout out, or if you want to shout out your band or your release or your tour or whatever, or your friend, your friend's birthday. Also at Jamie Joss on Venmo. And of course, paypal.me slash Josta. If you want to donate to the show, any amount is appreciated. And uh, we appreciate the subs over at patreon.com slash Josta. And maybe if you're, if you got a couple extra bucks and you want to check out a bunch of the great shows on gas digital, go to gasdigital.com too, and check it out there. 
Today's episode is brought to you by Century Media Dot Store. Century Media is helping us present their main sponsor of the Milwaukee Metal Fest, which is coming up May 16th to the 19th. And you'll see their bands like Lacuna Coil, Upon Stone, Night Demon, and many more on the bill. Check out centurymedia.store. Also got to thank another one of our presenters and a sponsor of today's show, the mighty IndieMerchStore.com. You can go and you can see they have a ton of Chaos and Carnage Tour merch up with Cattle Decapitation, Carnifex, Rivers of Nile, Humanity's Last Breath, The Zenith, and Vitriol, who uh, Kyle from Vitriol is coming up on the podcast very soon. Check it all out over at IndieMerchStore.com and go see those guys on tour. You can see the tour dates at uh, chaosandcarnage.com for tickets and VIPs, and you can grab merch once again at IndieMerchStore.com. Make sure you use that code JOSTA10 for 10% off. Last but certainly not least, I got to plug my own album and JOSTA for All coming out May 17th, all right? May 17th, which is a great day. A ton of great releases coming out that day. Gay Creeper, we got, uh, we got Chase from Gay Creeper coming up on the podcast in the next few weeks. But the album features Chuck Billy, Scott Ian, Steve Zetro Souza, Phil Demel, and many others. You can pre-order now at martyrstore.net. And if you are coming to the Metal Fest and you want to get a meet and greet, martyrstore.net has your meet and greets as well. All these links will be in the show notes, plus whatever coupon codes you can apply to save a little extra loot. I really appreciate you listening to the podcast now that we're back in uh, in full steam. And who's coming up next, Mike? I think I think Kyle from Vitriol is the next episode, right? Or is it or is it Steve Vai for episode seven hundred? I forget. Uh, for six ninety six is uh, Kyle. Kyle. And then we got Tim Lambisa, Steve Vai, Chase from from Gay Creeper, John Five from Molly Crew. We got a ton of great episodes coming up. So thanks again for all the support. And yeah, we'll be back with Kyle from Vitriol. Drink your coffee, do your push-ups, listen to Death Metal. Bye-bye. Executive producers, Jake Olszewski, Ben Lee, AJ Lewis, Garrett Keeping, Dan Smith, Nick Torito, JJ Hernandez, Joe Bartovic, Jason Jarvis, Chris Larice, Alex Smolin, Todd McKee, John Blewett, Richard Miller, Kyle Marg, Nate Leffingwell, Morgan Costner, Mark Tag, Zapagor Waikato, Niall Scollard, Kathy D'Ambrosio, Justin Steven, Jack Flanders, the Pit Commander, Andy Wilson, Jeffrey Kuhn, Kimo Humalamaki, Jonathan Metis, Brandon Cooper, Matthew Jankowskis, Jamie Kutcher, Ryan Undercoffler, Matt West, Ryan Maurice, Chad Green, Dallas Hendricks, Jacob Arensberg, Kenneth Moore, Kona Butterflies, Stephen Helm, Richard McIntosh, Jeff Stevenson, Ryan Williams, Larry Tooley, Dallas Bolin, Ryan St. Nathan Rex Madrid, Cameron Hendricks, Scandalous Official, Joe Monson, Let's Talk Resident Evil, Andrew Chase, Guy on the Couch, Chris Winchester, Antonio Reyes, Joe Otson, Dustin Stone, Lee Walker, Ryan Levson, John Hankis, Robert Bushaw, Troy Seal, Mark Horror Armenta, Jay Liberston, Nick Fowler, Mike Horgan, Emma Horgan, Arnorock, Patrick King, Oscar Brummett, Stacy Steineke, Fernando Somoza, Patrick O'Brien, Dominique Zimmer, Ryan Sanders, Lara Snyder, Daniel Berg, Milwaukee Metal Sausage, Adam Boss, Adam Mecklenburg, Some would say the Milwaukee Metal Fest is the Super Bowl of metal. May 16th through 19th at the Rave Eagles Club, featuring Mr. Bungle, Blind Guardian, Slaughter to Prevail, Testament, Avatar, Hatebreed, In Flames, Camelot, Death to All, Flames, Screaming Bloody Gore, and The Sound of Perseverance, Municipal Waste, Symphony X, Autopsy playing Seven Survival, Catatonia, Deicide, Terrorizer playing World Downfall, Possessed, Hammerfall, I Am Morbid playing Altars of Madness, plus 60 more bands. Get your tickets now at therave.com slash metalfest.